morning again. Let's open the second hour with uh, hymn number 185 from our hardback hymnal, hymn number 185. We're going to do two congregational hymns this morning, and then uh, Caleb Hickman is going to come do special for us. <clears throat> Let's all stand together, number 185. the account of the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 this morning beginning in verse 16 verse 16 I have a problem reading but I'll get through this if I can Jesus saith unto her go call thy husband and come hither the woman answered and said unto him, I have no husband. Jesus said, Thou hast well said that you have no husband, for you've had five. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. And that saidest thou truly. The woman said, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. She's going to ask him a religious question, this Samaritan woman is. She's had a lot of practice getting married, and I'm sure she's defensive. Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, but ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in 
spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am. The word he, if you'll notice, is in italics. It's not in the original. What the Lord Jesus Christ told this lady was, I am. He is God. Now, there's a lot of comfort you can take out of this. One is it's a comfort to know that if you've been married five times, you can still be saved. That's a comfort. But the main thing that I take out of this this morning is this. It's 2 Timothy 2, 19. The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Whether you're a five-time married lady of Samaria whether you're a little sawed-off publican tax uh, man that up in a, in a sycamore tree because you're too short to see over the crowd, whether you're a captain of the host of the king of Syria, but you have leprosy, whether you're an Ethiopian eunuch riding in a chariot in a dead middle of a, of a blasted wilderness, God knows his own. God knows the names of every one of his children from before the foundation of the world. And the comfort is this. If we belong to God, God will send somebody for us in our day of grace. He'll send someone for us and they'll have the gospel and we will believe. Just like this lady did here. A woman with no name. But Christ knew her from forever Father we thank you for being gathered here this morning in your name Father you, you know our weaknesses Father and you know that we have no strength Father you know that we are grass but you still love us Father you still watch over us you still forgive us of our sins you still strengthen our faith we know that there are two or three gathered here this morning and the Lord is here we would ask that he would give us, Father, an open heart and an open mind that we might receive the gospel, take it into our hearts and minds, Father, and take comfort from the things that Christ has done with us. Be with Greg, Father. Strengthen him as he brings the message this morning. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together once again. We're going to sing hymn number two from your gospel hymn, Spiral Hymn, hymn, uh, hymn Book, number two. Send 
the message from thy word that may joy and peace afford. Let thy spirit now impart Christ's salvation to each heart. Please be seated. and free. Oh God, be merciful to me, who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, whose anger he retains no more. His grace and mercy shall endure. I smite upon my troubled breast with deep and conscience guilt oppressed. Christ and his cross, my only plea. O oh God, be merciful to me. Is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity, his anger he retains no more, his grace and mercy shall endure. No words nor deeds that I have done can for a single sin atone. To Christ the Lord alone I flee. Oh God, be merciful to me, who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, his anger he retains no more. His grace and his mercy shall endure. And when redeemed from sin and hell, with all the ransom throng I dwell, my raptured song shall ever be. God has been merciful to me, who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, his anger he retains no more, his grace and his mercy shall endure. Thank you, Caleb. <clears throat> Don't you love listening to Caleb sing? It's a blessing. <clears throat> we open your Bibles with me to Psalm 68. Psalm 68. I've titled this message Perfect Freedom. Perfect Freedom. The scripture says, If the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. And then the Lord said, where the spirit 
of God is, there is liberty. Liberty. My hope this morning is that we will leave here a free people. And that the Lord will minister a spirit of grace to our hearts and set us at liberty. Having destroyed his enemies and ours. Now Psalm 68 is a prayer. Let God arise. Let God arise. Lord, raise up in my midst and let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Now let me ask you a question. What is it that keeps you from having liberty? What is it that keeps you from being free? Some people might say, well, it's my sin. It's my sin. That may be the the cause of it. The problem with that answer is that we've all come into this place as sinners. All men are sinners. What I want to say to you this morning is that the thing that keeps us from having liberty is the fear and the doubt and the bondage that sin causes. That's the enemy. That's the enemy. You see, some of us will leave here, by God's grace, having our sin covered. Others will leave here having made a renewed commitment to do better, to sin less. And that renewed commitment will last about as long as it takes for the next temptation to come. What you and I need to know is that our sin's been put away. Is that the Lord Jesus Christ himself has suffered all the shame and all the penalty for our sin. The Lord tells us in Romans chapter 8 verse 1, There is now, therefore, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk Not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The arm of the flesh cannot save. The scripture says that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the true circumcision who have no confidence in the flesh. Oh, I pray the Lord will enable us to have no confidence whatsoever in our commitments in our fleshly efforts, that we will be able, by the grace of God, to rejoice in Christ Jesus and walk in him. Now, turn with me to Numbers chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10. We'll begin reading at verse 33. Moses is leading the children of Israel through the wilderness. And they departed from the mount of the Lord. That's Mount Sinai. That's the mount of the law. So they departed from the mount of the Lord, three days journey. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days journey to search out a resting place for them. Now that ark is the gospel. That ark is the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, it was was made of wood, which symbolizes his humanity. It was overlaid in gold, which symbolizes his deity. Inside the ark was a 
copy of the commandments which represents the Lord Jesus Christ as our king who not only gives the commandments but he himself fulfilled all those commandments. Inside the ark was, a, was the rod of Aaron, you remember, that budded, which represents the Lord Jesus Christ as our priest, our intercessor before God. And inside that ark was an ophar, the scripture says, of manna, which represents the Lord Jesus Christ as our prophet, the one who himself came as the word of God and gave us the truth of who he is and what he's accomplished and how God is pleased to save sinners. That ark, everything about that ark was the gospel. On top of the ark was the mercy seat. And God told Moses, he said, he said, you have Aaron, kill the lamb and put the blood on the mercy seat and here I will meet with you. And when I see the blood, I'll pass by you. So everything about that ark and the ark went before the children of Israel and uh, the Lord made it clear, you don't do anything without that ark. You remember, when, you remember when Joshua brought the children of Israel across the Jordan into the promised land? The Lord told Joshua, he said, you, you have the priests who are carrying the ark to put their foot in the Jordan. And as soon as they put their foot in the Jordan, the water dried up. And the, and the ark had to go through the river before the people could follow. That's, that's the gospel. That's our, that's our Savior. He must go before us. Look, what, what is he doing? He's searching out, notice in verse 33, a place of rest. A place of rest. Resting from our labors. <laughs> Say, well, aren't we to try and do better? You know, the, the struggle of faith is to labor to enter in his rest. We're all by nature wanting to wanting to produce some kind of work. And uh, the, the, the struggle is to rest in Christ, is to rely upon him and trust in him for all of our salvation. Look at, look at the next verse, verse 34. And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day, and when they went out of the camp, and it came to pass when the ark set forward, that Moses said, Rise up, Lord. Rise up so that, that Moses is praying for God to destroy the enemies as they go through the promised land, I mean, go through the, the wilderness and to protect them. And he's calling on the Lord to rise up and let thine enemies be scattered and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. So the Lord rises up to defeat his enemies and then he sits down, enabling his people to rest. The Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, and he was risen up. He was, he was suspended between heaven and earth. He suffered the full wrath of God's holy justice. He bore in his body all the sins of all of God's people. He was risen up. And he was risen from the dead and ascended back into glory. And the scripture says that he now is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. That we might rest, rest in his finished work. Now that's perfect freedom. Perfect freedom is being able to rest in the accomplished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Perfect freedom is looking to Christ and trusting him to destroy the enemies. Of sin. Now, turn with me to Joshua chapter 3. This is where Joshua is bringing the children of Israel across the Jordan into the promised land. This river of death, you and I are in a sense, we're we're still in the wilderness, aren't we? We're living here in Babylon. But the Lord Jesus Christ, our Joshua, has, has crossed the Jordan. And he's gone into the promised land. He's provided for his people. And here Joshua <clears throat> takes the people of God and he brings them across. In verse 9 of Joshua chapter 3, And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, 
Come hither, and hear ye the words of the Lord. And Joshua said, Hereby shall you know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out before you. <clears throat> oh, the Jesus that most people worship today is a miserable failure. He's doing his best to get folks saved. He wants to save everybody, but he's just not capable of getting it done unless men give him his way, unless men cooperate with him, unless men allow him to come into their hearts. He's, his hands are tied. Our God is not a failure. He's, he has succeeded in accomplishing the salvation of his people. And he says here, he, Joshua says, he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgasites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. And behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over before you into Jordan. Now, what's all those ites have to do with one another? What do they have to do with one another? What do they symbolize in your life and in my life? Well, they are all the descendants of Canaan. Every single one of them are the descendants of Canaan. You say, well, who was Canaan? Canaan was the fourth son of Ham. Ham was the son of Noah. You remember uh, Japheth, uh, Ham, and uh, somebody help me out. Yes. <clears throat> and Ham was, the, Ham was the one in Genesis chapter 9. Well, let's just turn there. Genesis chapter 9. Shem, Japheth, and Ham, the three sons of Noah, who with their wives were saved on the ark. And now the waters have receded. The scripture says that Noah planted a vineyard, and he made wine, and he drank that wine, and he got shamefully drunk. And now he's lying naked in his tent. And Ham goes in. And uh, looks on his nakedness. And Noah wakes up and finds out what Ham had done. And now in, in Genesis chapter 9, the scripture says, In verse uh, 22, and Ham, the father of Canaan, now take notice of that, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backwards and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backwards, and they saw not their father's nakedness. Now Shem and Japheth represent grace. They represent a covering of our nakedness. Noah had, had sinned shamefully, and Ham goes in and exposes and mocks Noah's Naked, uh, Noah's nakedness. Shem and Japheth, on the other hand, take this garment, a picture of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and rather than mocking their father, rather than looking upon his nakedness as Ham did, they walk into his tent backwards and they take that garment and cover his nakedness. Now, that's, that's what you and I need for God to do. We need for him to take the garment of righteousness and cover our nakedness. For we have sinned like Noah shamefully. And yet it's not, it's not so much the sin, it's the consequences of that sin that, that, that keep us from being 
from being free. Look what he says. And Noah woke from his wine and knew what his young son had done unto him. And here's what I wanted you to see. And he said, cursed be Canaan. So the curse now was not towards Ham, it was towards Canaan. And all of these tribes that we just read about in Joshua chapter 3 that the Lord said he was going to cast out were the descendants of Canaan. Cursed is Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant, and shall enlarge, God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So Canaan was cursed by God to be a servant of servants. And all of his descendants, that curse was passed down to. So now the Lord says, I'm going to, I'm going to deliver you from all your enemies. What did Ham do? He exposed the nakedness of his father. What did Shem and Japheth do? They covered the nakedness of his father. You see, when our sin is exposed, when it's, it, it, well, Ham did what the scripture says Satan does. Satan, the scripture says, is the accuser of the brethren. You see, that's where, that's where bondage comes. Bondage comes when, we, when, we, when, when our sin is exposed rather than being covered. Bondage comes when the shame and the guilt of sin is, is thrown in our face. You remember in John chapter 8 when uh, those Pharisees, those self-righteous Pharisees brought that woman who had been caught in adultery to the Lord and they wanted him to crack the whip of the law and make judgments about her. And the Lord stooped down and he wrote on the ground with his finger as if he didn't hear them. He's just writing. Now the finger of God wrote the law of God, didn't he? And uh, I can just see the Lord Jesus Christ writing in the dirt with his finger, the law of God. And he looked up and he said, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And the scripture says one by one, they were convicted in their conscience and they departed from him. In other words, they were standing there in judgment of this poor woman, and yet when they were confronted with the law of God, they realized in their conscience that they were guilty, and that guilty conscience drove them from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the bondage of sin. The bondage of sin is having our sin exposed. The bondage of sin is having Ham Mock us for our sin. The freedom and the liberty from sin is when Japheth and Shem bring the garment of righteousness and cover our nakedness. That's our freedom. When the, when the Holy Spirit, they, they walked away from the Lord because of their guilty conscience. A guilty conscience doesn't drive you to Christ. A guilty conscience drives you away from Christ. It is the goodness of God that leadeth to repentance. The Spirit of God never convicts God's people of, with a guilty conscience. He doesn't. The Lord Jesus Christ said, It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But when he comes... He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, of sin, because they believe not on me. You see, fear and doubt and shame and all those consequences of sin will only drive you deeper into sin. 
and to be exposed by the law, well, the, the scripture says the strength of sin is the law. So you put a man under the law, all he's going to do is sin more. The only power over sin is to have Shem and Japheth come and take that garment of righteousness and cover us. When the Spirit of God convicts us of sin, of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they did bad things? Is that what the scripture says? No, it says of sin because they believed not on me. When the Spirit of God convicts God's people of sin, they're not brought by the Spirit of God into deep despair and shame and depression and fear and doubt over their sin, over the bad things that they've done. They're brought by the Spirit of God to see that they haven't come to Christ for their sin problem. They've been trying to solve their sin problem on their own. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that your experience? When the Spirit of God convicts us of sin, it is because we believe not on Christ. That's, that's the way the Spirit of God works. He doesn't, he doesn't do like Shem. That's the enemies of God. The descendants of Shem, all those descendants were the enemies of God. That God said, I'm going to drive out. I'm going to drive them out. What Shem did was he tried to embarrass his father. He shamed his father. He exposed the nakedness of his father. The Spirit of God doesn't do that. The Spirit of God points us to the Lord Jesus Christ and shows us that our problem, our real problem, is not our bad behavior. Our real problem is that we're not looking to Christ. We're not trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not resting our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not having our nakedness covered by Shem and Japheth with a robe of righteousness. That's that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Do you see the difference? When the Spirit of God comes, He will convict the world of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father. You see, when the Spirit of God convicts us, He convicts us of our self-righteousness. He causes us to realize I've not been looking to Christ for my righteousness. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. When was the prince of this world judged? He was judged at Calvary's cross. He was defeated when the Lord Jesus Christ bowed his mighty head on Calvary's cross and said, It is finished. Sin's been put away. Satan's been defeated. You see, your enemy is the consequences of your sin when you don't look to Christ. It's the shame. It's the guilt. It's the fear. It's the doubts that affect every part of your life Yes, those things came as, as a result of your sin. But it wasn't the sin in and of itself. That's the enemy. It's the, it's the lack of looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Let me show you that again. Turn with me to um, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. This, this is the gospel. This is the liberty wherewith God has made us free. 
free from the penalty of sin, free from the power of sin. One day, one day to be free from the presence of sin. First Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> Verse 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Baptism saves us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, when we submit to the ordinance of baptism, we are declaring that when Christ died, I died. And that when Christ was risen from the dead, I was risen from the dead. That's what Paul meant in Philippians when he said, Oh, that I might know him and the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. I've not yet attained that full knowledge, I've not yet apprehended that which has apprehended me. But this one thing I do, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. You see, religion is all based on getting folks to commit themselves to live better. The gospel, the gospel of God's free grace is a call to God's people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on him. Rest on God. God's people hate their sin. They don't they want to they want to honor God with their lives. It's just that we don't we can't fight flesh with flesh. Though you walk after the flesh, the weapons of your warfare are not fleshly. They're not fleshly. You're not going to defeat sin by making, uh, by, by, by having your sin exposed and thinking, well, I can be, if I just get a little more committed, if I get a little more sorry, if I get a little more uh, uh, devoted, then, then I'll, be able to, I'll be able to be free. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, to bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his obedience. And it's, it's the only power that we have over sin. It is. He is. <laughs> he is. So... Peter says, we have a good conscience. How are you going to have a good conscience? You're guilty, aren't you? You're, you're, you're a sinner. And, and if, if, if Canaan has his way, if Ham has his way, all he's going to do is expose more and more of our nakedness before God. God says, I'm going to drive out those enemies. I'm going to drive out those who would expose your nakedness and I'm going to clothe you. I'm going to clothe you in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrected. The scripture says that Christ was offered up for our offenses and raised again because of our justification. So Peter's saying here, I'm going to have a good conscience towards God, not by the putting away of my flesh. You know, I, well, I could have a, I'll have a better conscience if I could just live better. No, the Lord says you have a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's the only way you're going to have a clear conscience. Turn with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 22. Oh, we gotta we gotta read we gotta read verse twenty and twenty-one. 
by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. When the Lord Jesus Christ suffered God's holy justice on Calvary's cross and gave up the ghost, the veil in the temple was rent. And God now says, come. The spirit and the bride say, come. Come. We have a high priest over the house of God. He has ascended into glory. He's seated at the right hand of God. He lives forever to make intercession for us. He is our life. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Not in full assurance of, uh, of, of, of living a better life. That's not the, it's in full assurance of faith. I'm confident that if God gives us faith to rest our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he'll, he'll direct our steps in this world. <laughs> he will. <clears throat> Let us draw near with a, true assurance, with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. How are we going to have our conscience pure before God? Only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Only if only if Shem and Japheth bring that robe of righteousness and cover our nakedness. What a picture of, of the church and gospel preachers and, and the declaration of Christ. You see, Shem... The world, you remember, you remember Job's friends? What were they? They were Shems. They were Shemites. <laughs> That's all they were. Pointing out Job's sin. Job, you're just not coming clean. Job, if you'll just admit to your faults, then maybe you can get, maybe you, maybe you can do better. Maybe you can make some renewed commitments. And God was moved with wrath because Job and his friends sought to justify themselves rather than God. Job, at the end of the story, says, Oh, Lord, I abhor myself. <laughs> I had heard of thee by the hearing of my ear, but now mine eyes have seen thee, and I repent in dust and ashes. Lord, I'm, I'm nothing but a sinner. Verse 23, Hebrews chapter 10, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. What is it to hold fast the profession of our faith? What is the profession of our faith? Christ is my life. He's finished the work. He's put away my sin. He's my righteousness before God. He's all my hope of salvation. He is the profession of my faith. Listen, brethren, if you leave here thinking, well, you know, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do better. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get things worked out because I, I'm, I'm suffering as a result of my sin. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a handle on this. You're not going to be free. That, that commitment, as I said a few moments ago, that commitment will last you about as long as it takes for the next temptation to come. That's all. That, that's an attempt on the flesh to fight flesh with flesh. It's an attempt of the arm of the flesh to, to solve the spiritual problem it's thinking, you know, religion is all about exposing men's nakedness and creating doubt and fear and shame as a means of motivation. The gospel is free. And if the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. Where the Spirit of God is, there's liberty. This is... The Lord says, he, here's, here's the church. Go back with me to our text. 
Listen to, listen to what Hosea said. <laughs> they eat up the sin of my people and they set their hearts on their iniquity. Now that's the hams of this world. That's the hams of a guilty conscience. That's the hams of works religion. That's the hams of legalism. Setting their hearts on our iniquity and eating up the sins of the people of God. Exposing their shame. The Spirit of God doesn't do that, brethren. The Spirit of God sets his people free. And he causes it. If there's any conviction of sin, it's because they believe not on him. If there's any conviction of sin, it's because they attempted to establish their own righteousness before God, forgetting that the Lord Jesus Christ is all their righteousness before God. If there's any conviction of sin, it's because they're trying to defeat the devil, not believing that he's already defeated That's liberty. These, all these tribes were the enemies of God. Now go back with me to Psalm 68. Let God arise. Let God arise. Let the ark move forward to find us a place of rest. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He left the glories of heaven. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are cursed by the law. You see, we can either go back to the law, or we can go to Christ. <laughs> you can't mix the two. If it is of grace, it can no longer be of works, otherwise grace is not grace. You can't mix the two. It's either all of Christ. You see, it's, a, it, it's trying to mix, it's trying to mix the, the, the slime with, with, with bricks made with hands. It, it can't be done. Christ is going to get all the glory. And God's people are going to be free. They're going to be free. And whatever changes need to be made in their lives, and I'm not suggesting that sin's okay or that we don't need to change. All I'm saying is that the power to that end is in the hand of God. It's the gospel of his free grace. It's the liberty. Nothing, even the psychologists of this world know that people's problem is not their behavior, it's the shame and the guilt and the fear that come as a result of the behavior. And so what do they say? What do they teach people? Well, it's not really your fault. What are they trying to do? They were trying to relieve men of a guilty conscience by saying that it's not your fault. And so men go around lying to themselves, believing, well, it's not really my fault, so that... That way I can relieve the guilty conscience. And they live a lie and they die a lie. I'm not saying that. It's your fault. It's your fault. But what I am saying is that the Lord Jesus Christ has already put it away. He's put it away. He's not waiting for you to do your part in order for... And he, He's calling on you. Come out of Babylon, O Zion. Come unto me. Forsake that works gospel and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and rest all your hope on him. Don't allow. Don't allow Ham to shame you. Don't allow Ham to expose your nakedness and think, well, if I can just I can just be, do better or feel enough shame. I can get this. No, no. Shem and Japheth are bringing the robe. And they're not even looking at your nakedness. <laughs> they're walking in backwards and they're lying the robe on their father's nakedness to cover him. There's the, 
There's the gospel. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. Oh, I pray that, that the unbelief, the self-righteousness, the fear, the doubts, the shame, the worry, all those things that are consequences of our unbelief, that the Lord will drive them away. To drive them away. They're all the descendants of Canaan. All the enemies of God were the descendants of Canaan. They were all following after the sin of Ham back there in Genesis chapter 9. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melted before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. <laughs> rejoice, brethren. You know, the only way to have a clear conscience is to not be guilty. What does the Lord say? I have separated your sin from you as far as the east is from the west, and I remember them no more. <laughs> There's liberty. God said, I don't remember your sin. I put it away. All I can see is the blood of my son. Your sin's been put away. There's a clear conscience towards God through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm looking to Christ, I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to live in doubt. I can be free. I can have liberty. And I can exceedingly rejoice. Sing unto God, sing praises to his name, extol him that rideth upon the heavens for his name, Jah. Now that's Yahweh. That's the name that God gave to Moses back there at the burning bush when Moses said, whom should I say sent me? And God said, I am. Tell them I am sent you. What does that name mean? Well, that passage you read earlier, Robert, when the Lord said, prior to where you read, when the Lord said to that woman at the well, if you knew who it was that saith unto thee, give me to drink, you would ask him and he would give unto you living water. <laughs> and then he said, he that speaketh unto you, I am, I am. I save in the manner in which I save. I accomplish everything necessary for the salvation of my people. I'm the righteous one. I've justified my people. And now the Lord said, look to me. Look to me. Look at verse 5. A father to the fatherless... And a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. Now the fatherless and the widows were those who could not get any help from man. Those who were destitute of any help from anybody. Was the father and the and the widow, the fatherless and the widows. That's 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 us. Lord, I can't help myself. The strength of my arm cannot deliver me from my sin. I'm a fatherless, I'm a widow. You remember first Kings chapter seventeen when Elijah had brought through the word of God that great drought in Israel and a famine was in the land? And by the way, Amos says in Amos chapter eight. I will send a famine to the land, not a famine of bread, nor of a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the word of God. Now that's the famine that we live in. May God open our ears and enable us to hear his word. 
and to trust Christ for our salvation and to be set free in him. Elijah went into a town and he saw a widow woman carrying two sticks. And he said to the widow woman, he said, fetch me a drink of water. And she goes to get it for him. And while she's walking away from him, he says, while you're at it, bring me a morsel of bread. And the woman turns around and she says, of a truth, all I have is these two sticks, a little bit of meal in a barrel, and a few drops of oil in a cruse. And I was just headed home to make a fire, to bake a cake of bread, to feed me and my son, a widow and the fatherless, so that we could die. And Elijah said, you do that. But make for me first a morsel of bread. And I promise you by the word of God that that barrel will not be empty and that cruise will not go without oil until the drought is broken and the famine is over. And she believed God. And she brought to Elijah her last bite of bread. And the barrel never went empty of meal. And the cruise never went dry of oil. Why? Because she believed God. She believed God. And God's calling on the fatherless and the widow to believe him. Look what he says. A father to the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. Now this is the holy habitation of God. This is where he's promised to make himself known. And he said, I'm going to feed you with bread. What is that bread a picture of? Well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the bread of life. I'm your sustenance. And what is the oil a picture of? Well, it's the anointing of the Spirit of God. And the Lord said, I'm going to provide my son through the anointing of my spirit all the days of your life. So that however bad the famine is out there in the world, I'm going to feed my people in this holy habitation. Every time they come together, I'm going to satisfy their souls with the truth of the gospel and feed them with the bread of life and anoint them with the spirit of God. Believe me, I am a father of the fatherless and I am a judge of the widows and I'm going to provide for my people. What am I going to provide for them? A covering for their sin. A covering for their sin. I'll close with this statement. And I, I know somebody's going to twist this. Your enemy is not your sin. It's what you do with it. You try to fix your sin problem on your own, and yeah, it'll be your enemy. You bring that sin, all your nakedness, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will find that the consequences of sin that trouble you so, all the doubts, all the fears, all the discouragements, and you'll find yourself rejoicing exceedingly. <laughs> rejoicing exceedingly in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in putting away your sin. And the only power that you'll ever have over sin is grace. It's Christ. It's the gospel. You can't fight flesh with flesh.
If you're a child of God, I know you hate your sin. And I know you want to. You see, the enemy, the enemy is the way we attempt to deal with our sin. And I'll just, I'll just say this again. The, the Spirit of God doesn't use guilt and fear. The Lord himself said, Perfect love casteth out fear. Now, perfect love is the love that God shows to his people in the work and person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Cast out fear. Cast out fear. I introduced this message by saying I wanted us to leave here free people. <laughs> I hope we will. I hope the Lord will set us free and that we'll find ourselves looking to Christ for all our righteousness and for all of our justification before God, all of our salvation. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you've promised to meet with your people in your holy habitation. And Lord, how we how we hope that your spirit would, would drive the gospel of your grace home to our hearts and enable us to rest in Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Brother Tom, 27. number 27. And we're going to have the Lord's table. I'm going to ask the men if they'll come and distribute the bread and wine, please. 27 in the spiral hymn book.
you able to rejoice in that hymn we just sang? That, that's it. That's it. Free from the law. Oh, don't let Ham expose your nakedness. Take that robe of righteousness. That's what Christ came to do. Here's the... I'm sorry, I didn't realize we were... Come on, Yuko. I'm sorry. My mistake. God made him, the Father made the Son, sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The only way to have a clear conscience is to look to Christ. Rest in him. He is seated at the right hand of God. Look to his finished, accomplished work. He's the only one without sin. That's what this unleavened bread is all about. It's the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, this is my body. As often as you eat it, eat it in remembrance of me. Remember that I'm the only one that lived without sin. And you can't do anything but sin. Your righteousness before God. And your clear conscience <laughs> and your liberty and your freedom is what I've earned for you through my perfect life of obedience. Do it in remembrance of me. Aaron took that blood sacrifice and put it on the mercy seat. Mercy. Mercy. That's what we need. Unmerited mercy. Mercy withholding from us what we deserve, which is judgment and wrath. We don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear wrath. We don't have to fear judgment. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ has already, has already taken all of that. That's what, he, that's what he did. That's what he did on Calvary's cross. He is our propitiation. The judgment of God has been put away through the shedding of his blood. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Brother Hugo, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?